so today I was going to present on um, a computational pipeline I've been working on called IFCMAP for, WG, for whole genome bisulfite sequencing data. Um, and it's available at GitHub, on uh, the Libre Institute GitHub that we um, talked about before. Um, and it also has a documentation website. Uh, I'll get more into that. But, um, yeah, um, I guess just for an overview of like WGBS in general. So the goal behind um, bisulfite sequencing in general is to profile DNA methylation. Um, and as a lot of you know, like a lot of you know how important DNA methylation is in studying things like schizophrenia, also other other things we don't really do at LIBD, like cancer. Um, but um, so with bisulfite sequencing, I guess, a little background. It's like you treat DNA with bisulfite, which converts um, unmethylated cytosines into um, thymines. And, it, um, and so the, the cytosines that remain um, when you actually do like treat, uh, handle things computationally, um, you can infer that they were methylated. Um, so that's sort of a way to measure where methylation occurs in the genome. And with WGBS, you can do it across the entire human genome. Uh, and one of the, like, a couple of the main goals behind WGBS are like, from the analysis side, a lot of times you'll try, you want to compute um, DMRs, differentially methylated regions. So like genomic regions that are different between two groups of interest. So like in our case, probably something like schizophrenia and controls. Um, another type of analysis you might do is um, MeQTLs, which I haven't worked with too much, but um, basically the goal is to like infer a functional relationship between like particular methylated lo loci and like how they function. Um, then from the computational side, um, some challenges are like, since it is the entire genome, it's just huge data-wise. So um, in my experience, it's been a terabyte or two for each sample that we process, and we've processed thousands of samples. Um, so that's just something I've had to consider when working with this. Um, and then there's also a lot of steps to perform before you take the raw sequencing reads and then actually get the methylation proportions, which are usually what you want for statistical analysis. Um, so like you might perform trimming, alignment to a reference genome, and then a couple other steps. Um, so then like a, the tool that I've developed for this is called BioCMAP, um, a bioconductor friendly methylation analysis pipeline. Uh, there's a big work, workflow diagram with a, a bunch of steps, but like the big summary is that you take raw sequencing reads and then eventually we want to process things so that we have an R, a couple R objects, since we like to work in, with R and especially bioconductor, um, and those are ready for like statistical analysis. Um, so yeah, on the right, you see that there are like two modules and historically this is because on the left side, the uh, alignment to the reference genome, um, we use a tool called Arioc that's GPU accelerated and we haven't really had GPU resources up until recently at, at the cluster we work on. So we've had to actually sort of perform this first module on a separate system where there were GPUs, transfer data and then perform the second module. So just in case you're wondering why we split it up into two different pieces. Um, but yeah, there's a few different things like the QC step, trimming sometimes, um, blend it to a reference genome. And then ultimately we want to extract the methylation portions into our objects. Um, and then just to, we'll do a more interactive segment, but just like as an overview of what the R objects look like. Um, so they're BS seq objects and that extends summarized experiment. So if you're familiar with the summarized experiment, it's like very similar. Um, so the way we the way we do it is there there are two main output objects. We split it by the cytosine context. So um, basically, uh, for analysis, sometimes we'll we'll often want to separate it into cytosines that are that precede a guanine, um, which are called CPG. Um, CBG context, and that's like the most common methylation context. Um, but but um, everything else is called CBH, and that's also of interest, especially for neurons. 
But anyways, that's why we separate it into two pieces. Um, so the assays are um, big matrices of uh, methylation proportions, coverage counts. Um, if you're the CPG objects, we also have like smoothing coefficients. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then another thing of interest is that like this, the call data, which stores information about the samples. Uh, we collect metrics from along basically the entire pipeline. Um, the information from like task you see, from trimming, from alignment, um, such as like number of, if, they're, if the samples are paired in, for example, we collect um, the, the number of concordantly aligned reads. So some of those metrics could be useful for like, um, you can treat them as covariates sort of in downstream analysis. So things, um, things you wanna control for. Um, and then another detail is like the assays, since these matrices are so big, often um, we, we use the HDF5 array package um, from Bioconductor to basically keep part of the uh, matrices on disk until you need them in memory. Um, so that's just like a trick we do to like sort of make it memory efficient. Um, and I also want to mention, um, I mean, we'll do an interactive segment, like I said, but like, I do want to mention that we have this resource um, on the documentation website um, where it's sort of like a, a vignette walking through how to use the alpha objects on real data. So in this case, like, um, this is what the vignette looks like for the example data set we use from the Price et al. Um, paper a couple of years ago. Um, so like the left is like what the table of contents looks like, and then the right is like a few different figures, um, sort of put nicely together. Um, so like an example. Uh, so like for Figure A, for example, we're comparing. Um, Average methylation rate for cytosines in different contexts against each other, and seeing like what the correlation is. Um, and all of these plots, they're, they're colored by the cell type of the samples. So like green is uh, green is glia and uh, orange is neurons. Um, so like figure B, we um, before this we would attach like sample metadata. So including things like age, sex, diagnosis, or whatever. So that can allow us to produce plots like um, how the methylation rate, average methylation rate of cytosines um, changes with age for different cell types or whatever information you have about the sample. Um, C is like a classic type of DMR plot differentially by third regions. Um, so this was just like an area of the genome where there are a lot of significant differences in methylation across like a couple different regions. Um, but yeah, just as a, like a brief overview of what you can sort of do with alpha objects, but we'll get more into that. Um, so yeah, in this like next segment, I'll actually sort of show you how to actually use BioCMAP rather than just like talk about general stuff. Um, so basically the first thing we can do is, no, not that. Um, I'll just go through and actually like setting it up. So I'm going to basically first clone the repository. Um, and I'm gonna go over here. We're just gonna start this fresh. So I have this directory over here that's like mostly empty, um, but we'll work here. So first I'm gonna clone uh, the repo. And actually, well, this is going, I'll just open up the documentation website. So yeah, from the GitHub, you can scroll over here and there's a link to the documentation site. Uh, so what I'm about to do is I just install the pipeline, but if you have questions about how to do that, we have like pages for it. In this case on JHPC, it's super simple. Um, basically just following this like section right here. Um, so like I clone the repo and uh, it's still going. Um, basically just run a single command, go into the, into the repo and then to install it, we run 
just scripts with the JHPC out. So that just installs like some R packages and uh, sets up the test files. So it should be pretty quick. Uh, and then, yeah, we just like use modules um, for all the software. So it's not like it's, it needs to actually um, download or install software because it's already sort of handled. Um, okay, so that's going. All right, um, so once you have this ready, like this sort of two files, I know there's a lot of files here, but like two of them are probably the ones you'll be most interested in. One of them is the configuration file in this comp folder. Um, so since we, we uh, split it into two modules, I'm just gonna open up the first, the one for the first module, which is first half of JHPC config. Um, maybe I should make this a little bigger. Um, so in here, are, there's a lot of like smaller settings that you can tweak, but I think probably the most important is like that people will care about is the annotation settings. So we, we pull annotation files or reference files from uh, Gen code. So um, this setting in particular controls like the version. Um, so Gen code, Gen code always comes out with like new releases. Um, this is like the default release that we have for human. Uh, and you can just simply change the number to like, I think 40 is the most recent. So um, you can change that. Um, there's also this like make this uh, variable here, which controls like, GenCode has a bunch of different versions of each genome. Uh, and we pick sort of two of them as possible options, what we call main and primary. So main is like the canonical uh, chromosomes. So like the first uh, 22 and then XY and the mit mitochondria. Uh, and then the primary, Includes what Genco considers primary, which has a bunch of like extra contigs and scaffolds and stuff. Um, this is again is like described in better detail in the documentation if you want to check. Um, but then uh, Ariat has a bunch of settings. I think we, we tried to get sensible defaults for JHPCE. But you probably, I mean, you don't have to worry about like all these uh, technical details, I guess. Um, but it's there if you want to explore it. Um, another thing that's possible you might run into if you're working with a big data set is like running out of memory. So I just want to mention that like memory settings are in here. I won't really go into too much detail of how to change them, but like if you're familiar with the cluster options, so um, you can pretty much just tweak those. But the doc, the docs have more guides on that. If that's a situation you're going to encounter. Um, uh, that's mostly it for the config. Um, so I guess the next step is we will, we have some example data and I'm just gonna show how you like uh, point biopsy map to the inputs. So like the input files are gonna be like fastq files. So in this case, I have like this directory of fastq um, with this data set that we'll uh, work with for this demonstration. Um, so we see like a bunch of different in this case, we actually have five different samples um, with different names. So how do we show BioC map, like how to process these files? Um, I'm actually going to, I mean, I know how to do this, obviously, but I'll go to the, the docs just to show that it's like there. So I'm going to scroll over to this input section. Um, and so, yeah, for the, the first module, we need this file called samples.manifest. I've probably talked about it with Speakeasy if you if I've ever if you've heard me talk about that. It's the same thing. Um, but basically, let me just it's probably better to just show this visually. Um, this this is what a samples manifest will look like. It's a text file. And um, for paradigm data, since you have two different um, mates in, in the pair, um, you'll have like for each line we'll have the path, the first one. Uh, the path to the second one and a uh, an ID that you want to uh, associate the sample with, and then these zeros are um, you can optionally provide MD5 sums. The pipeline doesn't actually check them to like verify file integrity, but this is sort of to, for compatibility with old format. Um, so usually we would just provide those as zeros. So um, yeah, you provide a bunch of different lines for each sample. Another option you see here, we actually use the same ID. 
in two different lines. And that's like a way to automatically merge um, files. So if you have like a single sample split, two different pairs, you can automatically merge them by just providing the same ID. So that's like one of the features. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and actually produce this file for our experiment to just show you how, how that works. Um, so we have these fast key files here. Um, I'm actually going to just, I do, I, I like to do some R. Um, so I'm just gonna make a file called like create manifest.r. We're gonna do this interactively. Um, I know right away that I'm going to use the JAF lab package, uh, which includes like a function for vectorized string, string splitting, which I love SS. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> use that one a lot. Um, and then usually how I do this is like, I will get the, so it's all in one directory in this case. So I'm just going to use a variable for the, uh, what the directory is, which is this, that'll be useful. Um, and then typically we'll get to the path of the first, um, first read in the pair. So usually I'll do something like this, but you see the stop files function. Um, you pass the directory and then since we're trying to match the first reads um this takes a regular expression so it might look a little awkward but basically you try to choose r1 um yeah that's that's what i'm gonna do yeah um so anything that ends with um, r1 you have to escape the uh the periods um so that, that's what the double backslash is but Anything that ends with this fast Q that GZ and then dollar sign ends the string. Uh, also, we want the full path. So I'm going to use this argument. We'll do the same thing with um, the second read. Actually, let me actually open R. So I'm not like just hoping my code will work without testing. <laughs> uh, Um, actually, normally I'll include it just to like um, make sure I'm like not. I can all obviously visually inspect the paths, but often I'll do like um, just manually check that all the files exist. Um, so yeah, it looks good. But I'm, I'm gonna look at it as well. Um, it looks like yeah, we can the files we wanted to do the same thing for the second read. Um, yeah, and so the next step is we want to like associate these file files with sample IDs. So in my opinion, it looks like for these files, um, but the important part is like the part that starts with W. I don't think we care about the combined or the reseek. Re so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split the file name by the um, underscore here. Uh, I'm gonna use the, that JAF lab function, SS, vectorized string split. Um, so I'm just gonna take the first read. I'm gonna split it by underscore. And by default, it takes the first um, field. So that's all we need to do to add. Just, that will work, right? You use base name. Right, yep. That's uh, something I always forget. Um, yeah, because we did, these were the full paths. So we wanna just take the end of the file name. Uh, yeah, and that's what we were looking for. Um, and the next part is pretty simple. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make a uh, variable for like where we want to put the manifest, um, which we can just put it probably in this directory. We do have to call it samples.manifest. Um, and then creating the manifest is just a, um, it's a tab separated file. So I actually just use the paste function. Might sound kind of weird, but uh, path to the first read zero since we're not providing MD5 sums. Um, second read zeros and the IDs. Again, this is tab separated, so I have to specify that. That's typically what I do. It looks awkward to look at, but usually I just sort of 
<laughs> eyeball it a little bit. Um, and then these, the backslash T will actually convert to a tab on that right file. Um, so I just use right lines and then we gave it the path. So this should be good. You have a common run line four. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I just wrote it, but I forgot to. Um, yeah, okay. So this should produce a manifest file that we, uh, uh, it's kind of awkward to look at. Um, but yeah, this is what we wanted. This is exactly what we wanted for the structure. Um, so this looks good. Um, okay, so then how do we actually run BioCMF? Um, so we'll go into the repo. And I mentioned earlier that there's like two different files we'll care about. Um, so this is the second file that well, I call like the main script. It's a shell script that actually submits the pipeline. And we're on JHPCE, so we'll open this from the first half. Um, and um, yeah, so basically uh, the part you'll care about is like the main next load command, which runs the pipeline. Um, and so there's a bunch of different arguments. One of them right away is like the sample one is, is it single or paradent? We're using paradent samples, so I need to change that. We are using HG30A reference. Um, you can also do HG19 or MM10 for maps. But this is good for what we're doing right now. Um, and yeah, nowhere here do we specify the inputs. So we have to do that um, with the input argument and um, pass the directory to samples.manifest. Um, so that's this. Um, so that's what that would look like. Uh, I'm going to pass another, a couple optional arguments that I typically use. Um, one is just like explicitly say where the output folder should be. Um, and that can be like where we are. And just, I'll just call it out where, you know, if I was seeing that out. Um, another thing is like Nextflow uses a temporary working directory for files. And I just like to keep track of where that is. So uh, it can get kind of big and once you're done running the pipeline, like you can just delete it. It takes up a huge amount of space. So like, I just like explicitly like saying where it should be, um, but it's, it's optional. Uh, that's there. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, I think these are really the main options that you should care about. Uh, so I honestly, I will often miss an option and then we'll, we'll see how that, um, We'll just sort of see, <laughs> and you can check in the log or something like stuff, which might be useful to show, anyways. Uh, this code to like log the runs so you keep track of data sets, but since this is an example, I'm just going to comment that out. Um, and yeah, I think this looks good. I'm going to save it and um, yeah, let's exit R here. Uh, um, so actually, let me just, okay. I, this is something that I make a mistake about often with Zoom calls is I just like totally miss the comments. So I'm just gonna see if there's a, this message. Yeah, nothing has been said on the chat. Nothing, okay, cool. Uh, um, yeah, so we're here and we just need to, so this is a script, this bash script, um, we can just queue sub. So actually I'm gonna do that. Um, so we just queue sub, run the first half JHPCE. Um, and then, yeah, we can sort of track that. Um, I'll give it like a minute and then we'll sort of like look at what the output log looks like and stuff like that. Um, so we spawn the loader jobs or there were already, oh, already right. kind of loader jobs already. Yeah, I just happened to be running a couple. Yeah, this is actually a real kind of bio scene that I'm doing up here. Um, other ones speak easy, but yeah, that's other stuff. <laughs> um, oh, and actually, you know what? There, <laughs> when I write it, I normally use a um, my own annotation directory. So right here, um, I just recognize this process is like pulling the reference files, um, which it'll do the first time. 
and it'll cache the files that you do if you use the same annotation settings. But um, cool, it's running past UC. Let's just take a look at the log. Um, you can do watch key stat if you want on the terminal. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I should use that command more. Um, um, yeah, so it's the, the log will go in the same directory as by default since we have this up here. Um, as where the shell script was submitted. So that's right here. Um, okay, so it's running. I mean, we're not obviously it's still going, but I do want to point out that like one thing that's useful in, is in the top of these logs. Um, we try to sort of this, I mean, most software tools do this, but like um, printing the input objects that the user did. So this can be useful for like if you're um, Obviously, if you need to write like a method section of a paper and you're like, how did I process this data? I don't remember, it was like a year ago. Um, keep the log and it will show you like what um, get conversion you used, whether you uh, trim some samples, uh, and you know, all the settings you use so you, you know exactly what you did. Um, the rest of the pipeline is honestly the log is a bit awkward because the next level of commands expects you to run this interactively, but I don't find that practical. So it'll sort of repeat um, since it sort of posts the output interactively. It will, it will repeat the log. So if you want to find the progress, you just go to the bottom, um, and then you can see that it's on the fast QC step. Um, but once it's done, it'll say very clearly that like completed. Um, so that's how you know when it's done. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess the next step is we can, I mean, it's not gonna finish in like obviously during this presentation. So I think we can work with a different, a different data set that's already ready. Um, and we can take a look at the output files. So I think we'll do that. Um, um, actually, should I kill this maybe? <laughs> you, you just leave it. Yeah, I'll just leave it in there. Um, Cool, yeah, so let me open our, uh, and yeah, I have these like paths here. Um, so right now I'm gonna open up a different data set um, and work with the output objects, like I said. You have enough memory? Here? Yeah, I do, I made sure that, so yeah, I use like 40, you need quite a bit of memory for working with this, even though it's like HDF5 facts. Um, I use 40, 40 gigs. Um, I know right away I'm gonna be using the BSC package. You maybe write your commands on a new R script that way, like. Oh, that's yeah, I should be tracking my doing. You're right. Uh, yep. I'm also going to be using the HDF5 array package since that's how we, the objects are stored. Um, and then um, these are, I'm going to be referencing local paths so on the class here. Uh, first, Will be um, and upload the here package. Um, yeah, I used to like here for, I think we've talked about here before. Um, um, yes, yeah, so actually, let's take a look at this. is just a CSV file. So um, let's do, let's see, um, like, PD for phenotype data equals read.csv. And actually, let me write this up here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is, I should have just printed the head of it probably. Um, yeah, so this is. Bunch of phenotype data for this data set. Again, this is actually the price at all data that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, but yeah, we have a bunch of things like age, uh, sex, race, um, and some other variables. Um, so th this is something that wouldn't be, BioCMAP doesn't have this information yet. So typically we'll like run BioCMAP and then with the output objects, we'll attach the phenotype data afterward. So that's what I was trying to, trying to get at here. Um, let me 
uh, also put the output directory to this data set. Uh, actually, I should look at this. I should show you guys what it looks like. Uh, 